even it is on the fringes of the topic and some parts it extensively overlaps with Elvio's paper but it wasn't on purpose, trust me. And uh, uh, I will skip the part with the civic trust actually because of the lack of time <laughs> and uh, it seems that gaining trust takes a lot of time. So. Uh, I will speak the topic, actually the issue uh, or the problem I will discuss is the problem connected to political liberalism of John Rawls. Actually, Elvio was speaking in the morning, so we don't need to, to repeat what political liberalism is and its own idea of public reason. idea of public reason is a very complicated idea, but I take it as an idea that refers to political practice in plural democratic societies, meaning that in political justifications of political decisions that affect the lives of all reasonable citizens, we should use or bring in only premises that are somehow in accord with political values of democratic society or that are public reasons. When Elvio was talking, and after he stopped, there was this discussion, and it is clear that religious, comprehensive, some philosophical and moral doctrines, moral teachings and premises are controversial, and they are outside of the boundaries of public reason. But what is not clear in Rawls' own exposition of the boundaries of public reason is how it refers to scientific claims. Rawls mentions, I quote, that citizens should base their public justification on presently accepted general beliefs and forms of reasoning found in common sense and the methods and conclusions of science when those are not controversial. Now, when I was presenting one paper a few years ago in front of Timothy Williamson, he got pretty crazy about this formulation, saying everything is controversial, what are you speaking about? And a few sentences after this, uh, Rawls said something even worse. <laughs> he says, citizens should not appeal to comprehensive religious and philosophical doctrines to what we as individuals or members of associations see as the whole truth, nor to elaborate economic theories of general equilibrium, say, if these are in dispute. Now, this certainly raises some puzzles of putting comprehensive religious doctrines and economic theories or scientific theories in the same sentence. It seems odd to think that the reasons it is wrong to make public decisions on the basis of controversial, of controversial religious doctrines also make it wrong to make public decisions on the basis of controversial economic theories. Or any scientific theories, I say economic theories because it is in his example. The fact of current controversy by itself about the dynamics of supply and demand, for example, does not create the moral problem to which public reason is meant to be solution. The moral concerns about legislation based on particular conception of salvation, for example, do not obviously extend to legislation based on complicated economic theories. So in actual world, where many political decisions will be based on scientific claims, we have to know more about Rawlsian concept of non-controversial. And as Martha Nussbaum emphasizes in his article, the future of political liberalism as a source of political stability and reconciliation in democratic societies depends on filling this gap, gap between controversy meaning uh, in connection or, uh, or referring to comprehensive doctrines and controversy referring to scientific claims. So we must fill this gap in some convincing manner. So the attempt of this talk now is trying to somehow fill this gap or tackle this problem in <laughs> more or less convincing manner. Uh, so I will skip the part of civic trust, which I think is important, but if we will have time, then we can return back to it. 
So in what sense scientific claims are controversial? Well, it seems that there are three ways on which they can be controversial according to political liberalism. <coughs> in the first sense, as we already noted it, scientific claims can be understood as controversial symmetrically to controversy of comprehensive beliefs. In political justification, thus, we should not rely on comprehensive beliefs because we cannot <coughs> expect that other reasonable citizens who adhere to different comprehensive doctrines will accept that belief as good or public reason. So if the controversy of conclusions of science is symmetrical to controversy of comprehensive beliefs, then we are not allowed to bring into public justification or into, precisely to say, political justification or political argumentation, those conclusions of science that are in conflict with teachings of comprehensive doctrines. And this certainly raises, as we saw, some problems. It, is, it seems counterintuitive in a modern democratic societies. In a second sense, controversy can mean controversy within scientific community. According to this, we are not allowed to base political justification on those scientific claims that are not part of strict scientific consensus. This, this will also present a problem, big problem, because for any expert scientific conclusion, as the history of the litigation shows, some expert witness can usually be found to dispute it. <coughs> so now let's see the first way how scientific claims can be controversial, as we said, are, is for political liberalism somehow science, somehow symmetrical to comprehensive doctrines. And so scientific claims will, in the same sense, be controversial. Well, I don't think so, <laughs> because first, in uh, the lectures in history of moral philosophy, John Rawls makes it clear that political liberalism stems from three major historical developments. First, fragmentation of religious unity of the Middle Ages, which led to religious pluralism. Second, development of modern state with its central administration. Third, he mentions development of modern science. So we have three historical facts we have to take seriously in political theorizing. The fact of reasonable pluralism and divided comprehensive doctrines, the fact that beside reasonable pluralism there are shared institutions, it is not anymore the proverb whose realm is religion, and third, that the science is no more under control of any comprehensive doctrine, simply its role is not anymore to serve or to confirm any comprehensive teaching. The role of science is considered to be giving us information that we store in public depository of knowledge, where public means that this information equally concerns all citizens irrespectively of comprehensive doctrines to which they adhere. So scientific claims share with public reasons that they must be open to reasoned interpersonal evaluation, which religious claims don't have such demand. <coughs> so science clearly is not symmetrical to plurality of comprehensive doctrines. Conclusions of science if controversial, will not be controversial in the same sense as comprehensive beliefs are, simply because we cannot expect that all reasonable people, all reasonable citizens will accept them. But <coughs> is there something in the criteria of reasonableness itself, when we say reasonable citizens or reasonable doctrines, that demands from doctrines, if they are reasonable, to take into account empirical evidence or conclusions of science and to accept them if they are sound. The problem here for political liberalism is that if we insist on formal or epistemological criteria of reasonableness on which we would base such demand, then we will fall into perfectionism. It would mean that we clearly put some formal or epistemological criteria for reasonable doctrines 
and if they fulfill the, this demand, that, that means that these doctrines are more valuable or, uh, uh, or better <coughs> than other doctrines. The distinctive feature of, of political liberalism is that it abstains from evaluating comprehensive doctrines. And if we demand epistemological or rational scrutinizing of doctrines, then we, will, then we will too often trespass each other doctrines, which will certainly bring to mutual distrust, monitoring or rationally scrutinizing all the time a <coughs> set of beliefs. As Rawls writes, doctrines need not be by some standards logically correct or open to rational appraisal or evidentially supportable to be reasonable. The criteria of reasonableness in political liberalism are primarily substantive criteria of political reasonableness that includes the acceptance of ideas of fair system of cooperation, of freedom, equality, and burdens of judgment. Burdens of judgment here simply refers to the fact that we accept pluralism as inevitable effect, uh, effect of uh, free exercise of human reason under free <coughs> institutions. So, in other words, we do not scrutinize or question doctrines if they accord with democratic polity. But, on the other hand, it is not the case that formal criteria are completely neglected. In order to cooperate, reasonable doctrines must not be solid or unchangeable, but they must have tendency to develop in light of new information and new reasons with which they are given. This criterion is necessary for cooperation and deliberation because it is hard, if not impossible, to cooperate or deliberate with someone who simply does not take into account new information or new reasons to give her. So we can say that the doctrines are reasonable just in case its adherents are stably disposed to affirm it as they acquire new information and subject it to critical reflection. And if the role of science is to give us new information about the world that can be important for some political decisions, then reasonable doctrines must acquire it and subject it to critical reflection. New information can, for example, be overwhelming evidential support for theory of evolution. This information can be relevant in discussions about the public, pools, public school curriculum. Doctrine that would simply refute or deny scientific evidence on the basis of Book of Genesis and claim that public curriculum that includes theory of evolution is not publicly justified would not undermine public justification because we would be, in that case, we would be entitled to say that this doctrine is, in this certain context, unreasonable, and it doesn't have to be in some other context. So denying new information that is supported by overwhelming evidence will not result with reasonable disagreement to which public reason is the answer, but with a mere disagreement. Rawlsian criteria that reasonable doctrines are not solid and unchangeable, but that they have tendency to develop, includes standards of evidence and falsifiability that would allow it to admit mistakes and revise itself in the light of new information. <coughs> Rawls' inclusion of these conditions excludes what we can call fundamental doctrines which do not admit of change <coughs> in spite of changed conditions and evidence that contravenes their major doctrines. Reasonable comprehensive doctrines must adjust itself to accommodate many of the scientific and political realities of the modern world. For example, Samuel Freeman notes that Rawls claimed that, for example, Catholic Church with the Vatican II is such doctrine. Or I suppose that he would say also when Pope John Paul II said that the theory of evolution is not just a theory. But <laughs> the, 
But the reality of the modern world is not only that science is best provider of new information about the world. It is also, as far as we know, the best provider of treatments that alleviate at least physical suffering. For example, researchers in stem cell biology give us well-supported hope that we will be able to heal people with serious heart attacks, for example, or neural damages. On the other hand, this research includes in vitro fertilization of human egg and destroying it in the form of blastocyst three to five days later. Current Catholic doctrine opposes to such research because they believe that blastocyst is in soul from the moment of conception and has equal normative moral status as any other human person. Now, as we said, if the bait of financing the stem cell research takes place in public political forum, then it must be within the boundaries of public reason. Justification to finance such research must be based on public reason or political values that all reasonable citizens accept. Now, <clears throat> demand for health or demand for normal development of capabilities and avoiding disability cannot be dismissed as irrelevant for questions of justice, as certain tastes and preferences are. These demands can be understood as reasonable demands for primary goods that every person must have to be able to form, revise and rationally pursue its rational plan of life or as a part of political value of fair equality of opportunity. On the other hand, believing in soulment can be translated in the political value of due protection of human life, which is important value that all reasonable citizens accept. <coughs> So the debate, the, uh, debate can be presented in terms of public reasons. But decision to stop stem cell research would mean to give excessive weight to due respect we owe to human life in contrast to weight we give to primary goods or fair equality of opportunity. To justify this special weight assigned to due respect for human life in these contexts, would bring in non-public value or belief that blastocysts have non-overridable right to life from the moment of conception. This belief about the moral status of blastocysts is based on the concept of insolvent <coughs> that all reasonable citizens do not accept. It would be wrong to deprive people of some good or diminish certain political value on the basis of belief that we cannot expect that all reasonable citizens can accept, especially the affected one. Now, Elvio in the morning talked about uh, Philip Kitcher's idea of Himeric epistemology and somehow this idea of belief in the soul at the moment of conception, as presented by some philosophers, can be presented as a product of Himeric epistemology. Because, as for example, I don't know, James Rachels and Daniel Dubrovsky, uh, how they describe the historical moment of that belief was actually produced that, okay, the, the, the old belief about the installment was St. Thomas Aquinas' belief that the uh, embryo gets insold. 40 or 60 days after the conception, when it uh, uh, starts to have human shape. And then, as James Rachels and Dabrowski say, that uh, in the 17th uh, century, scientists looking through primitive uh, microscopes at fertilized ova imagined that they saw uh, homunculus, that fertilized egg looked like a man like a little man, and then they decide if it looks like a man, then it has a soul from the moment of conception. And in 1869, Papa Pius IX said, now this is the dogma, that the uh, egg, uh, that the, uh, the moment of insolvent is the moment of conception. Now, what is the, 
why it is the product of chimeric epistemology? Well, because it used the result from the science to, uh, to establish some religious belief. And then when the error of the science was uh, co uh, corrected, the belief still simply stayed the same. It is chimeric because they use scientific claim, and then when scientific claim change, they simply re re refute to accept that change. Now, what I want to say is that it is possible from the Kitcher's idea now to, uh, to oppose to that belief or debate with current Catholic doctrine and current Catholics. But what I want to claim is that Rossian, Rossians doesn't need to go into that debate in the public arena, in political arena, because they can simply say that the belief of insolvent is not open to reasoned interpersonal evaluation. While, while scientific claims in this debate are, and while political values that are used in this debate are. So there is different levels of, of, of public reasons from science and public reasons from political values. And non-public reasons that simply cannot override public reasons. So conclusions of science are not controversial in the same sense as the comprehensive beliefs are controversial. Science simply stands outside of comprehensive <coughs> beliefs. So the reason why, according to criterion of public reason, some scientific claim is controversial is not because it is unconscious or clashes with some comprehensive beliefs. So let's turn now <coughs> to the second sense of scientific controversy that we mentioned. Scientific claims can be controversial if they are disputable within within scientific community itself. And for any expert scientific conclusion, some expert witness can usually be found to dispute it. In that sense, many scientific claims are controversial. Of course, there are wide areas of science to which Rossian notion of scientific controversy or his idea of public reason does not apply. Many areas of physics, chemistry, and biology will hardly play any role in political justification. Rossian notion of controversy applies only to those scientific claims that can play a role as premises in justification of political decisions. Some scientific claims will surely play an important role for such decisions. For example, conclusions about anthropogenic climate change or <coughs> genetically modified organisms. So the question is, are there some implications of the idea of public reason for scientific practice? We said already that science is outside of reasonable pluralism of comprehensive doctrines to which idea of public reason is the answer, and that many scientific disputes will not present problems for which the idea of, of, of public reason is meant to be a solution. Various sciences have their own methods of assessing evidence and certificating uh, results submitted from researchers. But scientific practice itself is not outside of society. Scientific practice is one important part of epistemic division of labor, and so it is practice within society that is itself based on some values. If scientific practice is not or cannot be value-free, but is inevitably permeated with value judgments, as Philip Kitcher claims in his two books, then this can present a problem to which public reason has something to say. If values play an important role in scientific practice, then it is practice that in some instances should reflect shared values. Firstly, Values will play an important role in deciding which problems should be scientifically significant and for which problem it is particularly important to find solution. Secondly, scientific practice is very important for risk assessment of various products we use, and risk assessment will surely play an important role in political decisions about, for example, genetically modified food. It is Coming to regard scientific assessment of risks as value-free, but as many 
scientists know this is a wrong impression. According to the World Health Organization expert meeting called Food Safety, Science and Ethics, I quote, Codex policies emphasize that risk analysis should be based upon risk assessment as a scientific enterprise. Since the relationship between science and ethics is crucial in the risk analysis process, it is important to clarify what is meant by scientific. If scientific is taken to mean rigorous, impartial, and with interpersonal objectivity, then this is a good description of the standard for which risk assessment should strive. If scientific is meant to apply value-free and providing the only right answers in the identification, assessment and management of risks, then this is plainly false. The end of quote. In risk assessment, to be exposed to risk means roughly to be in circumstances in which it is possible that an event with unwanted consequences will occur. And to declare certain consequences unwanted is to make value judgments. And thirdly, value judgments concerning the consequences will also have impact on the amount of evidential support for certain conclusions of science so they can serve as legitimate premises in political justification. These values that are included in scientific practice must be transparent and they must be some part of democratic ethos. In other words, they must be values that all reasonable citizens can accept. There must be some kind of public input to science in scientific practice or some kind of control of scientific institutions. This is plainly the topic of Philip Kitcher's book, Science and Democratic Society. So, firstly, now, what kind of input or in what form, what form these democratic input should take? Firstly, we have to exclude majoritarian or adversarial democratic input to science. Which problems are scientifically significant or which scientific conclusions are legitimate as premises in political justification must not be decided by ignorant majority because that will be what Kitchen notes vulgar democracy or even by better educated representatives of various interest groups where decision will depend on the power of voices that will be something like adversarial democracy and will not reflect the true interests of the citizens. Now, second suggestion is simply to leave the things as they are, as Kitchen notes, and that is the autonomy of experts. We simply leave scientists alone <coughs> to pursue their research on their ways and on problems they find significant and give us their conclusions, which will not be controversial because it is simply their task to do it. This can prima facie be compatible with the idea of public reason. Scientists pursue their researchers and when they reach some conclusion on which there is some satisfying level of consensus among scientists themselves, and if these conclusions can play some role in political justification, then it is legitimate to use it in political argumentation. But as Teacher notes, there are some big problems with this view. For example, scientists are myopic. They ascribe too much significance to researchers that they pursue and ignore the interests of others. They can be guided by prejudices and wrong values. And of course, there is what David Eslin would call expert boss fallacy. Even if they are experts in the fields, they do not make them bosses in the domain of values. If science should aspire to collective good, then the domain of this collective good belongs to the domain of values. <coughs> and third suggestion of public input, which is also compatible with the idea of political liberalism and public reason, is Kitcher's own proposal of ideal of well-ordered science. According to his explanation, well-ordered science 
should be guided by outcomes of ideal conversation that satisfies cognitive and affective conditions. <coughs> it means that members of conversation have a wide understanding of various lines of research, what they might accomplish, how various findings would affect others, how those others adjust their starting preferences, and the conversationalists are dedicated to promoting the wishes other participants eventually form. So he has few phases how this well-ordered science would look like. In the first phase, citizens are tutored by the scientists. They know what is the stage of the science now, what are the possible line of investigations. After they are tutored, they present their preferences, what would they like to, uh, what re researchers to pursue. Then they hear other preferences and they somehow negotiate or deliberate, trying to achieve some result that will be acceptable to all. All the time in that process, of course, they are all the time tutored by experts and can ask experts what is the probability of this research going on or of this investigation. <clears throat> now, although the idea of well-ordered science is compatible with public reason, there are some problems with this idea common to all ideals in political philosophy. First, there is the problem of the second best. The fact that when one of number of desiderata is not satisfied, the other desiderata are no longer appropriate. That is, a situation that departs even further from the original list of desiderata may be better than one that more closely conforms to them. So, if cognitive condition is satisfied, if citizens are tutored, <coughs> and, but affective condition is not, they do not care about others, then we will slip into adversarial democracy. If affective condition is satisfied and cognitive is not, then we will simply slip into something closer to vulgar democracy. This is the point that David Essel uh, points out. Uh, somehow, if you have ideal, then uh, if you uh, if you fulfill some de desiderata of that idea but not the others, then the situation will get even worse than the situation that is even further from the ideal. And second, if ideal is too far, then there is a problem of adaptive preference formation. Simply because it is hard to achieve that ideal, we persuade ourselves that we want this state of affairs, and then it is hard to change it. This is what Jerry Coyne says that happens to socialists. They simply think that socialism is too far, and then they simply accept some kind of capitalism and say, so what can we do about it? And, and persuade themselves that they truly want it. Third, if we do not adapt to different preferences, then usually there are two methods. We became cynical to actual situation, saying everything is bad, but what can we do about it? Or even worse, we press the change, <coughs> believing that it is possible simply because we want the ideal, and actually the change is impossible, and we get the bad unintended consequences. This is something like wishful thinking. Now, it would be wrong to think of ideal conversation and something that should simply be mirrored in actual conversation or that ideal situation should be mirrored in actual situation. The role of ideal is better conceived as diagnosing the problems in actual situation and showing us the way of solving the problems by pointing to changes that are feasible in actual circumstances. Something like Rawls' own idea of realistic utopia. So in actual circumstances where we do not have time for fulfilling cognitive and affective conditions necessary for ideal of well-ordered science, expertism seems better solution than any type of democracy, or vulgar democracy, or adversarial democracy. To avoid adaptive preference formation, cynicism, or wishful thinking, we should look to problems of expertism or autonomy of science and how to improve it. And Philip Kitcher, Philip Kitcher notes what these problems are. As we already said, this is scientific myopia, 
it is that uh, in scientific practice there is a big part of uh, role or uh, impact of partial interests of money and power and uh, of ignorance of interests of others and what he knows that pri uh, privatization will not be solution to these problems. So we should understand these problems as obstacles for scientific institutions or practices in fulfilling their public task, which is the promotion of the public good, but how they are going to do it is to wide extent left to them, especially in circumstances where we do not have time to wait for tutored citizens that can represent various interests. <laughs> it seems that the ideal of well-ordered science shares with some similar deliberative ideals excessive hope about deliberative capacities and interests of ordinary citizens. Of course, we should seek to enhance citizens' attention to and interest in politics or in science, but nevertheless, there is also need to seek improvements in our democracy and in scientific practice that economize on citizens' limited attention and interest. So we must be alert to the ways in which delegation to institutions with some insulation from direct electoral accountability can improve deliberation, systems working, and public support. Such institutions are various. Uh, besides the scientific institutions, certainly some central banks are like that. They are not under direct electoral accountability and simply their claims and uh, their actions direct on us and direct on the collective <coughs> good. What seems crucial for this delegation to work and to strengthen trust, <coughs> trust in them are monitoring and reputation. Monitoring means that they must be in certain respect accountable and that society has legitimacy to express and according to circumstances even demand what the public task should be and determine what <coughs> the common good is. These institutions need to be jealously watched for such undemocratic tendencies as elite capture. And reputation is also very important because reputation takes lots of time to build it or to gain it and few or even one mistake to lose it. Reputation of such institutions is built mainly by three factors that are interconnected. High epistemic standards, narrative it uses when communicating with public through media or explaining their conclusions, and <coughs> responsibility it manifests when their conclusions are used in purposes of political justification. An example for such institution and for building a reputation can be David Carp from David Carpenter's book, Reputation and Power, where he describes how in the United States Federal Drugs Agency, or FDA, gained its reputation. <coughs> so his description is of the scientist Francis Kelsey, in 1960-61, FDA scientist Francis Kelsey judged the safety study submitted by the Merrill Company on behalf of the drug called, called the thalidomide for pregnant women to be inadequate in having neglected to adequately study the effects of developing fetuses. As Carpenter says, she stuck to her guns. <laughs> In spite of industry pressures, and the fact that European governments permitted access to the drug. It soon became clear that approximately half of the babies being born to mothers who took thalidomid were being born with severe physical defects. The effect on the reputation of Kelsey and the FDA was overwhelming, and Carpenter details the extent to which media stories and reports circulated a vivid narrative of tough-minded government medical scientists protecting the public from dangerous drugs. As Stephen Macedo, also writing of this example, notes, I quote, the image of the FDA as the guardian of public health and safety is now surprisingly well established in the public mind, 
along with the impressive level of public comprehension given the general state of public political ignorance of the FDA's methods of scientific trials and evidence. Now, what Macedo and Carpenter emphasized was the narrative that FDI and media used, that of scientists resisting interests of pharmaceutical industry and putting higher epistemic standards than other institutions did, strictly because of bad consequences. And labeling some consequences as bad is certainly the domain of values. Narrative and responsibility will be very important for making scientific claims legitimate premises in political justification, even if there is dissent in scientific community from these claims. In the example of FDA, it was justified and necessary to take into consideration all possible variables because potential consequences were harmful. Of course, in this example, it was clear that possible consequences were very bad. <coughs> Illness or death will hardly be disputed as bad consequences. But this example should also orient us in situations where consequences are not so universally taken as bad. Now, the example is, what if some scientists, as the result of intentional research, or as a side effect of some other research, arrive at the conclusion that some group with some characteristic, for example, race, gender, ethnicity, has some trait or shows lack of some capacity. Usually the issues are about racial intelligence, but also there was some papers uh, referring to Kohlberg's uh, investigation on moral traits or moral character, somehow that uh, woman cannot get to his sixth stage or universalize moral norms or moral, or moral rules that some used to say that then, then they cannot be politicians because for politicians we need persons who are able to universalize some moral norms. Now, consequences of this scientific claim can be very grave for this group. Situation gets even worse if there are widespread prejudices in society and if this group is already disadvantaged. By submitting this claim to the public, scientists cannot use narrative of value-free science <coughs> or the value of truth that overrides all other values. This would certainly cause distrust in science and alienation of this group from society. Possible consequences are not only bad because they will cause distrust in science, but they will also strengthen the prejudices and cause mutual distrust between citizens. Also, they, they will deprive some citizens of one of primary goods that Rawls explicitly mentions and that is social basis of self-respect. And if this conclusion is taken as a premise in political <coughs> justification, it will most probably be taken to justify, for example, withdrawal of resources from social welfare programs that are trying to equalize opportunity or provide that group with more powerful political voice. So, such scientific claim can diminish very important political values that surely are important part of democratic ethos. These are social basis of self-respect, equal opportunity, and political equality or political inclusion. Scientists have to be aware that in democratic society these consequences should be or must be considered as bad consequences in truly democratic society. So, like in the FDA example, harmfulness of consequences will demand to put even higher epistemic standards than usually, asking always for more evidential support for that claim and taking into account all possible variables in research with which they are challenged before they submit their research to the public. <coughs> even if this conclusion is published in scientific journal, Scientists have responsibility to react if this claim is used as a premise in political justification. 
Of course, maybe this will put heavy burdens on the scientists, but if we delegate to them autonomy in providing us with goods, then these goods must consider all citizens equally. The criterion of controversy will surely be that certain claim is in conflict with democratic values. On the other hand, in different cases, it will be unwise to put such high epistemic standards or such high amount or need for such high amount of evidential support. If political action is urgent, as in the case of anthropogenic climate change or absorptive capacity of atmosphere, and there is high probability that the delay will have catastrophic consequences, then, then constantly asking for new evidence can cause harmful consequences. <coughs> Manifesting scientific responsibility and certain narrative can make claims less controversial for political justification even if there are dissenters constantly challenging with new arrivals. In these cases, it will be plausible for scientists to say, as Philip Kitcher says, I quote, if the conclusions we propose to draw are correct, there are serious consequences for human welfare. If we were to delay, we should risk considerable suffering. Plainly, we cannot consider all possible variables. Our judgment is that we have taken into account the important ones. In these cases, it is not necessary constantly to reply to new challenges. It would be responsible from political liberals to demand that scientific claims should be used as premises in political justification only if there is reached full consensus. Some circumstances simply ask for urgent action. Okay, so I will stop here uh, before, before I <laughs> destroy you. <laughs>